In May 2019, SpaceX launched the first 60 satellites of their hugely ambitious Starlink Low Earth Orbit Constellation. These are followed in November by another 60 satellites, and they plan to launch another 60 around the end of the year. Well, I don't know exactly how SpaceX plans to operate this constellation. We can gather quite a bit of information from their FCC filings and from public comments by Elon Musk and Gwyn Shotwell. In this video, I'm going to look at how such a constellation might work, given what we know at the moment. Bear in mind I don't have any inside information, so this is what they could do if they wanted to, but probably isn't what they'll actually do. This is the underside of one of the first Starlink satellites. Those grey panels are phased array antennas, and they allow the satellite to steer very narrow radio beams so it can communicate with many ground stations at the same time without needing to move a dish around as it passes by at 27,000 km per hour. The same principles used by modern Wi-Fi base stations, but while they use just a few antennas to focus power in the general direction of your phone, each of those grey panels consists of a hundred or more small antennas. They can focus a radio beam only a couple of degrees wide. They can also steer a beam a long way to the side. According to FCC filings, a ground station should be able to communicate with a satellite when it's only 25 degrees above the horizon. OK, so what about the constellation itself? In November 2018, SpaceX revised their constellation plans, lowering the orbits of the first phase satellites to 550 kilometers and spreading the satellites into 24 orbital planes, with 66 satellites in each plane. Now, they've since revised those plans again, and I'll come back to that later. But for now, let's look at this constellation. SpaceX originally planned to use free space laser links between the satellites. The idea is that data goes up to a satellite using those radio beams, then hops satellite to satellite using lasers, and then down again using radio. As the speed of light in a vacuum is about 50% faster than it is in glass, communications latency via Starlink would be significantly less than via optical fiber. The problem is that those laser links are pushing the state of the art, and satellites launched so far don't have any lasers. This has led to a lot of speculation that Starlink won't be any good for wide area communications, at least until the lasers eventually get deployed. But I think that's wrong, and I'll show you why. Looking at this diagram again, if two places are far enough apart, but covered by the same satellite, it's actually faster to go via the satellite at the speed of light in a vacuum than it is to go via fibre at the speed of light in glass. This means it might still be possible to beat fibre by bouncing satellite to satellite via strategically placed ground stations. When I first looked at this constellation, I assumed SpaceX would spread out the early satellites, like this, to give good coverage. But then all the satellites from the first launch were sent to the same orbital plane. Here's what it looks like if you fill six orbital planes. You get these dense bands which give good coverage in a band around 50 degrees north, but intermittent coverage elsewhere. What you do get, though, is great overlap in the coverage between neighbouring satellites, like this. If a ground station has coverage at all, it can reach either two or three satellites pretty much all of the time. That's great for relaying data between satellites. Let's run some simulations and see how this might work. Here we've got just six orbital planes deployed, and we're using the published SpaceX ground station locations, plus a few others I added. Even with relatively few satellites and ground stations, you can get from New York to Seattle quite a bit quicker than the current internet. In fact, latency is pretty similar to optical fibre stretched tight along the best path, which isn't really possible in reality due to things like mountains and right-of-way issues. Now, one thing to remember is that while the orbital planes more or less stay in the same place, the Earth rotates under them once a day. This means that the paths used change over time, and so the best locations for ground stations also change. As more satellites are launched and more orbital planes are filled, not only does coverage become wider, but also the performance of these paths, relayed via the ground stations, also improves. The end-to-end -end latency decreases and becomes significantly less variable. With all 1,584 satellites in the first phase deployed, the latency between New York and Seattle beats fibre all the time. There is still some jitter, but it's only one or two milliseconds. The biggest improvement, though, comes if we add more ground stations. This opens up an intriguing possibility. Starlink user terminals will also use phased array antennas, so they're likely to be able to talk to more than one satellite at a time. Can we use conveniently located user terminals for relays if they're currently idle? Here I've picked locations every 100 kilometers or so. Once SpaceX starts selling service, there should be hundreds of thousands of locations to choose from, and many will be idle at any time. As the Earth turns, you can see how the choice of best relay changes. Even with relatively few satellites, if you have enough ground stations to choose from, 
you can roughly halve current internet latencies across the US. As more satellites are added, latency and jitter continue to improve. So, what's the downside? The red line shows the round-trip time using 10 dedicated ground stations. The blue line shows what happens when we use all these user terminals. There's a vertical line each time the route changes. Although latency is better, the best route changes much more often, in this case about every five seconds on average. Now, we could add even more user terminals to the pool we choose paths from, but there's very little improvement in latency, and the routes change even more frequently. Now, SpaceX's dedicated ground stations would actually use different frequency bands than their user terminals will. So, if there's a ground station in a reasonable location, it's better to use that rather than taking capacity away from other users. In the end, though, this is a trade-off between capacity and latency, which is a business decision. The first Starlink users will likely be in North America, where relays are pretty easy, but the satellites cover most of the world. Can we use relays to cross between continents? It turns out that crossing the Atlantic isn't too hard, so long as you cross fairly far north, near the northern end of the satellite orbits where coverage is much denser. You need relays in Newfoundland and Ireland, and a couple of ships. Now, ships aren't cheap, but they're a lot cheaper than rockets, so this is probably doable, and again gives latency that beats optical fibre. The Pacific is much larger than the Atlantic, but due to a quirk of geography, you can cross the northern Pacific without needing any ships. The path follows the Canadian and Alaskan coast, then hops along the Aleutian Islands, touches down on the tip of Kamchatka, then follows the Japanese islands. The relays I've chosen here are all located in towns or villages large enough to have a post office. Of course, if Kamchatka is out of bounds due to politics, then it looks like one ship would be needed. But again, this looks feasible. OK, so I think I've shown it's feasible to provide wide area, low latency communication using ground relays. But it does stress the routing computation somewhat. Here I'm showing the graph of connectivity that we need to constantly update and then find the lowest delay path through. My first solution of this took about one and a half seconds to update all the distances, figure out which satellites are in range, and run the routing computation. But with a few devious tricks inspired by how game engines work, I got that down to around 60 milliseconds. It should be possible to do a route computation for the whole world in less than 300 milliseconds, which is probably fast enough. What you see here is being generated, updated, and animated in real time on my laptop, and the frame rate's not too bad. Presumably, though, SpaceX will eventually get laser links between the satellites working. When they do that, will any of this matter? Here we're looking at the path from Toronto to Miami. This path goes north-south, and the orientation of lasers I'm simulating is better optimised for east-west traffic. It turns out that for this particular path, sometimes the lasers work better, and sometimes they involve enough of a detour to one side that it's actually shorter to go down than up via a relay instead. Here's another interesting path. This is London to Johannesburg. The current internet path is very long, as it follows the fibre off the West African coast. Crossing the Sahara poses a challenge here, as there are wide areas with no population at all. I've placed the relays here in towns that were large enough that I could identify a good-sized mosque on satellite images. These are exactly the sort of remote communities that Starlink could benefit. This is another north-south path where laser links are not very direct, and a ground relay path beats the lasers all of the time. But the best path here always involves some combination of lasers and ground relays. The precise combination is constantly changing, but using a mixture of the two is always good and a lot better than latency than optical fibre. Now, I said at the start that SpaceX have revised their plans again. On December 19th, SpaceX received permission from the FCC to redeploy the first phase satellites across more orbital planes, and indeed they've started to move the satellites already in orbit. Rather than 66 satellites in 24 planes, the new plan calls for 22 satellites in 72 orbital planes. There seems to be an error in the database associated with the FCC filing, but this is what I think they're planning. The main reason to make this change is that it provides earlier coverage over most of the US. But what does it mean for ground relays? It turns out that it's still pretty good. Once the first phase is complete, there's pretty much no difference between the new constellation and the old one for most of the paths I've discussed. It does, however, require a few more satellites to be deployed before the transatlantic and transpacific relay paths will work continuously. It's also worth remembering that this is just the first phase. If Starlink is profitable, 
SpaceX have permission from the FCC to launch another 10,000 satellites across various orbits, taking the total number to nearly 12,000. I'll examine those plans further in another video.